Hello, friends, and welcome to the CU Insight Network podcast. My name is Lauren Kolba. I'm the president and CEO at CUinsight.com. And it's my job on this show to have conversations with the thought leaders who support the credit union community. Together, we get to talk about all the issues that affect credit unions and the best practices that exist for them so that we can all learn from one another and improve our industry together. I am really excited for today's episode. My guest on today's show is Kurt Klassen, the Executive Vice President at Level 5. Kurt, thank you so much for being here. Laura, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Most of us did not grow up thinking that we would get to work with credit unions one day. And I always say I didn't even know what one was until I was working at one. Kurt, what did you want to be growing up? You know, that was a great question. And I was like, well, my very first thing I wanted to be growing up, I wanted to be an engineer and not like a mechanical or structural. We're talking the train engineer. Fortunately, I grew out of that one. But boy, that seemed like a great job. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a sports agent. I actually went to school at that time. That was kind of new. But obviously, I went a different path because so, here we are. But no, <laughs> creating unions was not on my on my <laughs> mind. So a long time ago, as that turns out to be now. I love that. So then what was the journey like to get you to this point? So from and train engineer to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A your- long way from trains, right? You know, I, I actually started working for a company out of Chicago, R. Donnelly. They're one of the largest printing companies in the world at that time. And they were getting into customized printing, personalized direct mail was kind of new at that point. And a lot of that ended up being something that we work with financial institutions on. And so that actually then migrated into statement printing where we actually did statement printing for financial institutions. One of the first companies to actually put statements on the internet. If that tells you 20 years ago, that's how far back we were. And it was a P it was terrible, but that's how it started. And then I ended up going to work for a company, a hardware company that brought cash recycling, cash dispensing to the market, which was invaluable to not only know how the technology works and how those integrations work within the technology ecosystem, but how that works from a branch functional standpoint was important. Had a, had also had a stop over at Equifax where we did credit services for commercial and kind of understood that credit underwriting and the proper process around that. And then ultimately that led me to design build, which I've been in for the last 12 years, which is really, a, I think, a great call, which I love, by the way, but it's a great culmination of kind of bringing all those parts and pieces together. We really have to be somewhat of a Swiss army knife where we can consult around a lot of different components. So as you said, uh, kind of went through the the back door to get through the front door. That's how I got here. That is a great journey, great story. And it sounds like you picked up a lot of really cool pieces of exposure and experience along the way, too. Absolutely. Well, tell me a little bit more about Level 5. What does Level 5 do and where does it add value for credit unions? Sure. Well, Level five really is we're 100 percent focused on financial institutions and about 80 percent of our business comes from credit unions. So credit unions are obviously a key component of what we do. But really, our whole we wake up every day really with our intent on how do we help credit union partners grow. And if you're looking at growth, we do specifically as it applies to the retail branching network. And so things like strategy. Where do we go? Are our branches performing? Who are the markets that we do well in? Where do we win? Where do we don't win? What's the products and services demand in that market? What's the right site location that we need to be at? The technology that's going to be best fit for the customer preferences in that market. And then ultimately, how do we translate that into a design that resonates with the members, gives provides a great member experience? And then ultimately, how do we execute that through the build stage. And what I always tell people, you know, I think everybody approaches these projects and there's a lot to consider, right? And that's almost overwhelming. And I think our we're structured intentionally to kind of allow to minimize your risk, create predictable outcomes, but make a process that seems very complex and, and put a lot of simplicity around that. But ultimately, we want to allow you to come out of there really understanding your differentiation in your market really giving you some key components of how you can then start to execute and grow, have a lot of confidence. And when you make those moves, that those moves are going to be meaningful in terms of loan and deposit growth. And really, ultimately, we want to be an extension of your team. We, we, You guys have a business to run already. And our job is to help take those pieces on and really be a partner with our credit union clients of how they ultimately start to initiate those growth strategies and all the way through the execution. 
One of the things I love about your approach to design build is that you're not just slapping a branch up. You know, it's not just, all right, well, we did this part, we're done. It's really informed by and driven by strategy. And we'll mm-hmm. talk a lot about strategy today. And I, I love that tie-in because it, to your point, it is such an integral part of the credit union's overall strategy, where their branches are, where where they're engaging with people. So I'm excited to talk more about that. Before we do, you all at Level 5 had a really exciting rebrand recently. There's a shiny new logo and a lot more, but can you tell our audience a little bit about why you set out on that journey to rebrand? Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, aesthetics always important. I think we all know the value of brand. It is your front porch to your organization, if you will. So I think we wanted to make sure our front porch looked as good and reflected who we are organizationally. And I think if you see the old versus now, you would see that that is certainly, I think, a transition in, in a new direction. I think it's better representative of who we are. But I think the real meat behind that is it's not just the aesthetic. But it's also how we tell our story. And I think what we realize, we have a tendency to, I always tell people it's a little bit about like reading the instructions on how to wire an electrical panel. And it wasn't really in the voice of how our customers and our our clients viewed that process. And so we're really trying to change the voice, if you will. And it's Simon Sinek always says, which I love, he goes, people don't care what you do. They care why you do it. And so I think we're really trying to be focused on the why. And what that ultimately means in terms of outcomes, as you guys know, if anyone's done it, it's it's a massive undertaking. It's a huge transformative process. We're still kind of getting through that journey. It's not the end. It's kind of the beginning. But we're excited about where it's taken us so far. That is really cool to hear about. I love what you're saying about putting it in the voice of the folks that you work with. And so to take that and then turn it more into the strategy of level five, and we hear a lot of talk about data-driven strategies, but we know that data alone is not enough. So from the credit union side, when you're working with credit unions, what do you see in terms of a data-driven strategy and how do successful credit unions take the data they have and actually put it into action? And then where does level five help with that? Lauren, I absolutely love this question. I I think it is the question, truthfully. Data has become, and I hate to say it, it's almost a buzzword, bingo. If you walk around trade shows and look at people's collateral, data-driven data, data, data. And I think we're good to the point in every organization, we're all swimming in data. We've got data. Boy, we've got data on top of data. And so what we're really trying to focus on is, hey, data is great. Everything you said is 100%. It's foundational. But it's really about the insights that you can pull from that data and partnering with people who can help you make informed decisions about what that data is telling. And data isn't always the whole story. And so a lot of what we do is also involve getting our clients that local intuition is key. We want to hear your voice in that process and how does that corroborate with what we're seeing from a data perspective. And then we actually spend time in the market to see is what we're seeing in the data really translating itself on the street uh, so we're making sure when we give you those insights, they're truly actionable and they're not just sitting in an ivory tower a thousand miles away with that's kind of that disconnect. So I think that is a, a key component. I always tell people out of that process, if you're really going to be successful with strategy, we're going to give you all the informed data you need in terms of where to go, what that means in terms of loan and deposit growth, what that means in terms of financial forecasting. But the other piece that really comes out of this, out of the data, which I think is so, so great that I really get passionate about is it helps you really understand what your differentiators are in your market. And I think what we often find, there's a little bit of a disconnect, I think, between who people think they are, how they're perceived, and how that really translates once we actually start to pull that data together. And what I always tell people, if you can come out of here and really understand your differentiation. Really understand where you win in the market and who you win with and where to find more like them. You're really getting on the right track. And a lot of our clients are dealing with aging memberships. And so the members they have now, they know aren't the members they need in the future. So how do you do that? How do you make that migration? That is a big sea change organizationally for people to undertake that. And so what we really try to say, if you're going to move into that market, what are the things you need to be thinking about? What do that means in terms of product and service demand at the local local branch trade area? We're not talking, you know, holistically. We're really getting down to the detail level. You really have to be that specific about it. And so what we really want to make sure is people understand that component of do you understand your market? 
Do you have a defined service delivery? How are you going to execute service in your branches? You have to organizationally make these decisions as you execute strategy. You can't bolt on experience and uh, customer journey and service delivery after. It really has to be integrated at the beginning if you're really going to get it right. Because all those pieces have so many dependencies, right? We're just talking about the branch network. There's digital, online, there's all these other components that have to be kind of thought through. So we really want to make sure we're, you're walking out of there with those things to find organization. Because if those things aren't, they have a tendency, it's kind of like the the tires are a little wobbly, right? And so we want to make sure we're really getting these those things locked down. And I guess the other couple of things I'd mention is organizational commitment to the strategy. And that's a level five responsibility and it's our clients responsibilities we don't want to do something where you go thank you guys and you put it in the drawer and we never see it again is if we we haven't done our job if this isn't something you guys take out on a daily weekly basis and say are we running and executing the plan is this really integrated into our dna or is this just a plan for the sake of a plan and so we really try to make sure we're giving you an actual plan that becomes kind of your roadmap, your playbook on how you're going to execute your branch strategy looking out the next five, seven, 10 years. So, and ultimately you have to execute it. And so one of the things we spend a lot of time on is what does that timing need to look like? There's a lot of considerations. There's internal resources on the, on the credit union side because these things cost real money and they take people and there's a time commitment from the organization to do these things. So we want to make sure they're on board and they're on board with the timing of how that's going to execute. And we don't overwhelm any of our partners by, you know, knowing that they have to be staffing and supporting and training and all these things along the way and making sure that sequence is all tied into the strategy. So it's very collaborative process if you're really going to dial in and get that right. But when it's done and it is done that way, the results are, are magnificent. So that's really ultimately what we're striving for. That's a long answer. What I'm hearing is you can't build a branch in a silo. <laughs> you cannot. You cannot. And and that's what I always tell people is you can't afford to get them. Most of our community credit union partners, they don't have an unlimited amounts of money, right? And so they, it's not like Chase where they can test something and spend 20 or $30 million. If it works, it doesn't work. Uh, we have to do all the design and planning and, and the work through at the beginning to make sure when we do execute into the market that we're executing on something that's going to absolutely produce results. And when we talk about those predictable outcomes, to me, that's really the key, the key component. So based on that strategy work and knowing that credit unions are obviously looking for a return on their branch mm -hmm. and their branching strategy, how do you successful credit unions go about designing their products, choosing their technology, and how that all kind of plays into that branching strategy together. What would you say is a successful roadmap for credit unions doing yeah, that? Yeah, I think I think the successful roadmap on that is is one thing is really making sure you understand local demand for products and services, which is, you know, what I always tell people, there can be great locations for a financial institution, but might not be for your financial institution, depending on where you win from a product and services standpoint. And also, you, and just conversely, you may things you may find things that you want to add to your quiver that you may not already offer in certain markets because of that high demand, or they support a demographic that you're currently not servicing well that you want to start taking advantage of. So I think that's really one of the keys from that perspective. I think technology preferences, what we try to give you some indication of is how likely are members within a specific trade area you know, comfortable with using member facing technology. Is that something that they've shown a propensity to use? We've seen those examples where you just put the wrong tech in the wrong, wrong branch. And there's a lot of nuances there. So I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. Um, but I think we want to give you some indication of the personalities that are walking through the door is really going to be uh, a key component. And you can't ever take out of it you know, the old what's in it for me. This is a business where you have to earn a return, be good stewards of the member's money. So what is that return in terms of loan and deposit growth? And ultimately, what does that mean in terms of the sequencing and the financial impact? So really, it's stitching all those things together, but being really smart and paying a lot of attention to what happens within that three or four or five mile radius around that trade area is really key and making sure you're customizing that approach for those individual markets as it makes sense. So that can impact 
branch size, it can impact staffing, it can impact technology. And so while we do love a prototype and we do love brand recognition and consistency, we also want to be mindful that everyone considers that relationship with their credit union within that branch that they go to. So we want to make sure we're being really thoughtful about what happens within each one of those specific locations. I want to ask you, too, about what I consider the fun part, which is branch design. Yep. How does understanding that specific market drive some of the elements that you might include in a credit union's branch design? Do you have any examples? Yeah, I would tell you one of the things we want to make sure to is how similar or dissimilar the market is that you're serving. We do find some that are, oh, my gosh, these people are all the same people. You know, they may have two or three nuances, but they like the same things. They have very similar educational backgrounds, very similar income backgrounds. And so when you when you have that type of scenario, product advertising, it can be extremely successful. And I think the key is understanding what the products and services that they want and then making sure you're delivering those products and services within that environment. We can go down a long road around how you do that. So I probably won't have time to get into that. But conversely, you may have a dissimilar market. And so that's going to really require like lifestyle advertising, testimonial type advertising. So and we also want to understand who are these people? Where do they work? What do they do? What's going to resonate with them? We do have a, a cool example from a credit union we did in Colorado. It's going to be very nuanced for people who aren't in Colorado, but they're very outdoors oriented. They love the mountains. They love everything about that lifestyle. And one of the things we did in each of their branches is we put the longitude and latitude in each one of the branches. And it, to me, from the Midwest, that means nothing to me. <laughs> um, but when you, when you do spend a lot of time in the mountains and hiking, they would come in and they would immediately point to that and they go, this place gets it. They get who their market is. So I think it's those fine details that you don't really know at the granular level until you really know who the market is and the personalities that you're serving. And, and to me, it makes the difference between a good branch and a great branch. And I tell people, the cost is really going to be about the same. So let's make a great one. So let's go through the time to really pay attention to who that customer is, how you then bring in your strategy, your values, your mission, your branding, and how do you bring those pieces together to really make that magic work? And so that's where I think it's kind of the combination of the art and the science piece. I always tell people you have to bring both. It's like you always pull the strategy in. Who are these people we're serving? What do they look like? What do they want? What do they do in their free time? What so you're going to know all of that stuff. You're going to understand what's the product and services demand. You're going to understand what's the technology? How do they like to be serviced in here? How do we make them feel comfortable? And then I always tell people, here's the three big things I can tell you. This is the secret sauce. So if you're paying attention, this is now's the time to, to write down. So we did a lot of research with a company called Motista around everyone talks about engagement and the branch. And so, but they always say, yes, absolutely. I'm going to back up for two seconds. Why? So when I ask people, what's your differentiation at a credit union? What is my answer 99 times out of 100? I'm going to guess people helping people or member service. <laughs> service. And I always say, you can't differentiate on service. I'm sorry to tell you, but the guy across the street, they know their customers' names too. And they're pretty nice people over there. So we really want to make sure what we're doing is we're really getting in the nuts and bolts of differentiation in a way that resonates, that a way that really is you. When people walk in and go, this is my place. I am I am at home here. It, I feel the work that they've done to bring out those local influence to connect with me from a community standpoint. So community is a huge one for engagement, is you have to make that branch a reflection of the local community. Still want to keep your brand, still want to keep all those things consistent. But how do we do that? And that really becomes a, an artful piece. Experience. You have to design the experience while you're doing the design. You can't go, well, it's done. How are we going to do experience here? Which happens more than often. It gets, again, you can't bolt it on after the fact. So we always talk, well, what does that mean? Well, you got to think about how is, what is it going to happen when they walk through the door? Are they going to be greeted? What's your staff going to be doing? Where is the transaction place is going to be? If they're doing a transaction, they want to transition to member service to the platform. How does that happen? So all of those things have to be contemplated and designed to really make sure that that comes across. And one of the things that came out of that research was I thought was an interesting point that I talk about a lot is that when we asked 
members, what they felt like when they went in to talk to a member's services represented, what was that experience like? And they all came back to, and the thing that hit high that we weren't expecting was anxiety. And I think we all think, hey, we're all nice people. Yeah. We're great. We're friendly. But I think people don't realize when it comes to their finances, there, there's just anxiety. They're nervous about it. And they, they equated it with like going to see the dentist or going to the doctor. And so I think we just have to be aware of there is a heightened sense of, of, you know, being anxious around what that might look like. And we, and we, so we went a little further. So why does that happen? And then they said, well, we don't like having our backs to the lobby. That's we, it just makes us, we want to feel like when we're sitting, we have the ability to see out. And I think it's because people feel confined. Yeah. And when they feel confined, it raises the anxiety. And so what we want to, we want to make sure it feels open. It feels friendly. They have a view of the lobby that we're not making them feel their back to the corner. They also get nervous when that member services representatives or they're typing on the computer and they don't know what's going on. Or they're, I think they're like, I know they're seeing something really bad. That'll be fun. So, so what we always say is how do we change that dynamic of it's not me sitting across. I'm with you. It's about that connection piece. How do we redesign that to make it more comfortable? Does it even need to be a desk? And the answer is they, no, it doesn't. So how do we bring that into a more friendly environment to make that better in a way that makes a reflection of you? I still people don't do something goofy because you think you have to do something different. Make it in a way that you're comfortable doing it. Own how that's going to be for you. And then the last piece is trust. And people say, well, how does trust come across? I think trust is about how you engage people and branch the level of warmth uh, that you do when you put around that and your confidence and how you stand behind your products and services. But again, that community experience and trust people. If you want to make a difference and you want to be just from good to great in a branch environment, I really think that is where getting those three components right. And it's not easy, especially on that first one, is to get those components dialed in. Again, I'm talking way too long. Well, you know, Kurt, I'm sold. If I had any branches to build, (laughs) you got my business. (laughs) All right, well, good. (laughs) <laughs> I'll, I'll update the sales forecast. All right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we look to the future, you just completed this really cool rebrand of the mm-hmm. brand new logo. What's next on the roadmap for Level 5? You know, I think we're always going to continue to push the envelope in terms of what it looks like from our, our strategy component and our consulting component. We brought in a big piece of artificial intelligence to kind of help us mine through data. Competition is fierce. I mean, I think we've seen what's the recent releases by Chase and Wells Fargo, and I think it was PNC with the, you know, they're really pushing into the markets now with new branches. I think we've seen, and from the credit union perspective, how many more recent field of membership expansions have we seen? So I think there's a lot of movement into the market and into new spaces. So we're just trying to make sure we're really refining that data down to the detail level. It's going to take that kind of expertise and diligence around really making sure we're pulling those really key components out of the market to make sure we could continue to have our clients be successful. So I think that's a big one. We're looking at putting things on digital applications, a mobile app to kind of bring some of those things more portable in terms of the strategy and some components about how we may do that from like a scorecard perspective, just bolting some additional things around around our consulting offering. Member segmentations continuing to be a big one is continuing to keep refining that, keeping getting in more detail because member behaviors are changing. Computer pattern patterns have changed with um with COVID, you know, lots of hybrid work environments. So we just need to understand how people move within their communities and that affects placement, that affects products, that affects a lot technology. So we just want to make sure we've got visibility into that. I think uh, we talked about the level five experience. I think that started with our website. These projects are typically three to five years engagements. We want to be a great partner. Uh, and, but I think we also recognize there's sometimes there's project fatigue. So we, we're like, how do we make this easier for people? How do we become that people? We walk through the door, they're, oh my gosh, level five's here again. Not, oh my gosh, level five's here again. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's where we're really trying to say is how do we work together as partners? So every engagement now, before we ever start, we like, how do you like to work with your with your partners? What do you need from us in terms of how many meetings do you like to have? How long do they need to be? How often do you meet with our construction team? So we just really want to make sure we're cognizant. I mean, I don't think people have ever been busier. I mean, I, I will tell you, I think our, our credit union leaders are tasked with more things than you could probably imagine. 
So we want to be the easier part of their day, not the harder part of the day, knowing that this is a huge organizational you know, responsibility. So we, we got to balance those two things, but I think we're just trying to be the best that it can be. I think people do. I don't know if you know, but we are a referral based organization. We don't have salespeople. So wow. we truly, our job and referral is what gets our business. So we want to make sure we're really doing the right things, making sure we don't just get one project, but we get the next 10 years of projects. And you don't do that by doing it the same way we did it even two years ago. So I think that's going to be you know, construction, better, faster, cheaper. I think we're always looking at with inflationary costs. I mean, we see costs in construction. I don't need to tell you guys what that looks like, but, you know, we're saying how is there creative ways to bring things to market with materials, with their container type projects, micro branch solutions? Is there a way to do that to A, get people on the market faster? Is there a way to get them there cheaper? And is there a way to just take some of the burden of the time and make that better. So I will tell you, that's uh, taking a lot of our, our resources right now to figure that out. The last thing is we do have a level five foundation, which is something we started last year, but we really didn't put it out publicly till we redesigned our, our brand and our website. But it's really about giving back to the community and the causes that our partners care about. I mean, our success is all hinged around your success, but a lot of that is based around giving back. And so that'll be something I think we'll continue to see more more from us in the in the coming months. That is just a ton of really exciting stuff. And I am guessing some of our listeners right now are asking how they can get in touch with you. So we're going to put contact information for Kurt and his team at Level 5 right here in the show notes. So if you are listening, you will see that there as well as the website for Level 5 with that brand new logo. Kurt, as we wrap up the show, I always like to have some fun with rapid fire questions. Oh boy. Do we let our listeners get I'm nervous now. <laughs> the questions are rapid, but your answers don't have to be. <laughs> and I will add a little asterisk here that uh, Kurt mentioned earlier that his kids were asking about his podcast appearance today. So will they, will they listen to the show? Unfortunately, yes. And yes, they will okay. they will point out every single thing I did wrong. Uh, and it'll <laughs> probably be streamed live on the TV when I get right. there. <laughs> All right. Well, shout out Kurt's kids. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one, Kurt, who is the one in your life that was a great leader and what makes them so great? You know, I was really fortunate. I think when I was early on in management, I had a, a gentleman I worked for when I was at R.R. Donnelly. At the time, he was actually based out of here, out of Atlanta. I lived in Texas at the time. And I think as a young person, I was under the, you know, to be a manager, I thought it had to be like this almost dictatorial, authoritative role. And boy, did he change my perspective on that. And uh, I think you've heard the term servant leader. I don't even know if that's the right, but he was really about you hire the great, great people. You support the heck out of them. You give them all the tools that they need to be successful. You invest in their success. You own that success and you let them do their job. And let them run and they will produce results beyond your wildest imagination. And it took me a while to kind of see the magic of that happen. But it truly became a way, I think, to if you really want to break out organizationally and you really want to transform even what you think you're capable of and your big crazy goals. I think that's a big piece of how you get there is is just be willing to invest in those people, hire the right people, love them through it and treat them like family. And they will run through brick walls for you. That is a great answer. All right. Rapid fire question number two. If you're going to splurge on something, maybe you want to treat yourself, what is something you might invest a little bit in, whether that's time or resources? You know, if it, for me, if you got to get me on the water somewhere and people say, what do you do? You want to fish? No, I don't want to fish. I, I just want to be on the water and it, it could be a cabin, it could be a boat. I just, that's kind of my Zen place. I've always remembered as a kid growing up, spent a lot of time on the water. And uh, to me, if I could get a little peace and quiet on the water, I'd spend a little money on that. So, There's a lot of good lakes in the Middle West. <laughs> there is. There is. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> Great answer. All right. Question three. This is a random question. If you traveled for work, what city are you most excited to visit, whether that's a client visit or a conference? All right. This is a give up answer. I'm just gonna, Everyone's going to hear this and go, well, no kidding. Right? I think it's San Diego. And I think it's because I just, A, I love the vibe in San Diego. I think the weather is obviously amazing. I've got a lot of memories of being there when I was younger. And I think you compile all those things together. It's 
it just makes it one of those places where I'm always happy to go. Don't get there as much as I would like to anymore, but every time I go, I'm like, man, I get off the plane and I already feel better. That's like, I just love the atmosphere and the energy and, and all that around there. Can't afford to live there, but, uh, <laughs> but I would like to. Who can? <laughs> Great. I love that answer. Great. All right. What is a book that you think everyone should read? You know, it's our president will read books and I'll share them with the, the leadership team. And one of the things he, he actually shared was a couple of years ago was a book called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that book, but it's essentially about the British rowing team was, hadn't won a medal since like 1912 or something like that. And they made a commitment in 98 before the 2000 Olympics were in two years that they were going to win the gold medal at the Olympics. And it's long story short as they did. But it talks a lot about how they took these big goals and what seemed unsurmountable. And I think people were like, you guys are, going, come on, you guys are terrible. And how they went through the process of kind of prioritizing really what was important, asking the why questions around, does it align with strategically with what they're trying to achieve and putting it in a very practical way. And I love that because it's really small chapters. And if you're ADD like me, you can read it real short verse, but feel like when you're done with eight, 10, 12 pages, you're like, wow, I, that's actually pretty good. I could, that's something I could actually use, which for me is perfect because I have a tendency to have attention issues. So it's better for me that way. I think that's the way of the world these days. We've got very short attention spans. <laughs> We're going to link to that book in the show notes here. I have not read that one, but I will add it to yeah, it. It's really, it's, I'm telling you, it's great. It's awesome. really great. Okay. Kurt, what has been your best hack? Or creating some kind of balance and integration between your work life and your life life? Yeah, I will say admittedly, this is not a good question for me because I've not done it well. And I think uh, as I get older, I would tell you from wisdom from doing it that that is a regret, frankly, than I have. And I would tell you now the things I do differently than I would have done even four or five years ago is learn to set the phone down every now and then. And park it for a while. I do know we all feel the need to be connected and the importance of that. I, I, I absolutely do understand that. I mean, that's critical. If people reach out to me at 10 o'clock at night, I'm going to answer. But I think we have to say, Hey, if there's times at dinner, if there's times with family, we can, we can spare it for an hour, hour and a half to really make sure we're present and we're focused. And I always tell you is take time for yourself. I think that was one of the things I would take vacations and work the whole time. And I think my family remembers me on vacation of sitting in front of the computer and not out doing the things with them. And I would just say, you just got to be present. And because when those opportunities pass, you can't repeat them. And I said, well, I would tell you, looking back on my life, I do have regret on that. I would have done it differently and I would try to do it differently now, but it's, it's always a struggle for me. But I would just tell you, better people make that a priority. I think it helps you, especially as it helps everybody else, recenters you, makes you really understand what you're doing all this for. And I think just gives you a chance to recharge a little bit. So don't learn from me. Learn from what I didn't do and, and do that better. I like it. Well, we're going to link to everything we talked about in the show notes, like I said along the way. But Kurt, my last question for you is, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share or any final asks of our listeners today? You know, I would just say challenge yourself to be great. I, you know, there's one of the things I talk about when I do my presentations, there's, there's a book and Lawrence go, oh, great. And now I got a link to another book, but there's an older book out there. It's called Differentiator Die. And it studies like 27 different product categories. And then the, the comparison the author makes is one between soap and banking. And on a scale of zero to 100, how much differentiation did the customer see between different soaps and different banks? And think about all the crazy soaps out there, all the different banks and credit unions out there. Banking got a zero yeah. on that score and soap got a hundred. Wow. So I'm like, if you can differentiate soap, that means we're just not there typically on financial issues. And I think the market is really craving that. So I always tell people, don't be afraid to be bold. Take a stand, be different. It's okay to have a strategy that's not the same as everybody else. I think that's where I think we've all it's all a little bit about we want to be everything to everyone. And I think it's just getting harder in our markets to do that. And so I would just say, hey, don't allow yourself because I, the new brand's a good example. I have a tendency to want to pull back to the way it used to be. And I think we have a tendency to do that organizationally and credit unions as well. And I would just tell you, be bold, be different, have a crazy idea. And if you crazy growth goal, let's go get it. And in the crazier it gets, you need to call me because we could be crazy about helping you get there. 
Well, what better partner than Level 5 to really level up what the credit union industry can do, especially through their branches and their overall strategy? Kurt, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was a blast. Lauren, thank you. I had a blast too. Hopefully I'll get invited back. Hopefully I don't get voted off the island. Um, You'll definitely be invited back. (laughs) Hopefully we can do this live in San Diego sometime. I would love that. Let's do that on the list. (laughs) Well, stay well, my friend. And thank you to all of our listeners today for tuning into the CU Insight Network podcast. And we will be back again next time. 